Friends and family, welcome back to Datages. We come together today for a big discussion, which will span the next two episodes of Datages, actually. Today, we're joined by a special guest who is a brilliant doctor, professor, and author. Dr. Mark Goulston is a board-certified psychiatrist, former UCLA professor of psychiatry, and author or co-author of 10 books translated into 43 languages with 600,000 plus copies in print, and with his book, Just Listen, becoming the top book on listening in the entire world. He's appeared on radio and podcasts, and notably, he's also a former FBI and police hostage negotiation trainer. Having recently listened to his book, Just Listen, I can personally vouch for the fact that Dr. Goulston is one of the foremost experts on listening, negotiating, and managing difficult situations. We're going to spend the first half of our discussion with Dr. Goulston today, talking about his expertise in these areas and applying his framework to to some of the most difficult topics tearing at the fabric of our world today. And as if that isn't heavy enough, the second half of our discussion, which we'll carry over into the next episode, will be based on the dadage, good health is not the only thing that matters, but without good health, nothing else matters. That episode will focus on the end of life, as Mark is bravely facing his own mortality, battling a diagnosis that could be terminal. Mark is here today to graciously share some of his precious time with us as he confronts the end of his life and reflects on what he's learned from 50 years of listening. Well before his own diagnosis, Mark has worked as a death and dying specialist, studying with experts in the field and developing his own life-saving and mortality-comforting empathic skills into an approach that he calls surgical empathy through decades of working with suicidal patients and doing house calls to dying patients. Certainly not the most upbeat of introductions, but Mark, I do want to celebrate the fact that you're here with us today and celebrate your generosity and taking time to share your wisdom with the Datages friends and family. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you for having me. And I've been looking forward to what we talk about too. Wonderful. And, and Mark, I, I may be the host of Datages, which means I have to do some talking here. That's just part of the job. But I'm really eager to spend today listening. So let's start there. You've devoted decades to listening. You cite it as one of your core values. What is so important about listening and what it truly means to us as human beings? I'll share a kind of a humorous anecdote, but it has some relevance to today, the world we find ourselves in. Years ago, I was walking to my old office past these two bare-chested surfer dudes, and they were drunk, and they were bantering with each other. They were in adjacent yards, and I passed the first one, and he says, Hark ye, in order for ye to pass, please tell us the secret to peace on earth. And then he started babbling with his neighbor. What they didn't know was I'm pretty quick on my feet. You know, as a hostage negotiation trainer, I've done a fair amount of media, so you have to be kind of quick. So I walk another five seconds, and I'm in front of the second person. And they're much bigger than me, and, and they're babbling at each other. And I said, hear ye, hear ye. And they look at me like, what? I said, I have the answer. And they look at each other, answer to what? I said, you asked me the answer to the secret to peace on earth, and I have it. And they look at each other, you know, can you believe this guy? And they say, well, what is it? And I said, it's very simple. Listen more than you talk. And they look at each other, they shrug their shoulders, and then they look at me and they say, ye may pass. <laughs> And I think Wow, so you passed the surfer test. I did. I passed the surfer dude test. And I think it's it's true. And there's many levels of listening. And it's interesting. I've been on a number of panels recently about mental health and violence and whatnot. I tell these panels, I say, you know, when they talk about policy and research, I say, everything I've done in my life is informed by pinpoint empathy. I don't have studies. I've been given a pass by the psychiatric and psychological communities because in 35 years of my suicide prevention work, none of my patients died by 
by suicide. I have a feeling that if I wow. wasn't seeing people that other people didn't want to see and scared other people, I would not get a pass. I think if I was doing your garden variety counseling, they would say, you're too unconventional. You're, you're not evidence-based. But because of that track record, they say, uh, in fact, you're something interesting. Over the years, there have been researchers in depression and suicide who have said, I'd like you to see my kid. And I said, you're at a big university. You study this stuff. Why don't you have them seen at your university? I'm just some guy out in the community. And they said, uh, we don't have your track record. And I said, are you interested in learning what I do? I mean, not a researcher, I'm a practitioner. And they said, not if it's not evidence-based and you don't have control groups. And I said, I've been too busy seeing people <laughs> to do that. And they say, well, we can't look at it unless it's evidence-based. And I said, so why are you sending me your kid? Well, because you have a better track record than us, and I'm worried about my kid. So I always defaulted to send me your kid. And so I never developed the surgical empathy uh, training program or the method. But as I faced my own mortality, I feel an urgency to share what I've learned in 50 years. And part of the urgency is it looks like I'm going to have something called a bone marrow transplant because I'm heading for leukemia, yeah. uh, acute myeloid leukemia, which, uh, you know, is not a walk in the park. One of the side effects from the treatment is sometimes cognitive impairment. And I think hopefully be a good sport if I lose my creativity and my ability to be reasonably insightful and articulate. I hope I'll be a good sport and be a dutiful husband and grandparent. But if I lose the ability to be creative and tune in empathically and be able to articulate what I've learned, it'll be a big hit. Well, it'll be a big hit, not just for you, but for the world, because if all of these other people in your field have refused to truly embrace, adopt, and learn what you have created as a system, because it's, as you said, not evidence-based, where does that system go if you're not here to bestow it upon others and to share your gifts. That sounds frightening to me. Yeah, it is. And I have on YouTube and TikTok two channels called I'm Dying to Tell You because it's almost like the universe is saying, hey, share this, Mark. So it's like for 50 years, I've been collecting dots by listening and they're all connecting like little beads of mercury going ding, 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 ding. And then I share them on those channels. Something I'd like to share with you regarding the current conflict and maybe how to talk to the people that you're facing, you know, who are getting all agitated. There is, a, I think there is research to support this, that when you can accurately attach the emotion that you're feeling deep down to something, as opposed to reacting emotionally, when you can identify, when you reach way down deep, what exactly am I feeling? And when you can just allow yourself to feel it, it dissipates in less than 90 seconds. But close to 100% of the world runs away from feeling feelings. So there's a bunch of words I, uh, that I want to share with you, because I think if you're having conversations with people who are identifying with either of the sides in this, and the words that come to mind is so, and I'll probably create a video on this and put it up uh, today or tomorrow. I was trying to reverse engineer wanton violence. And as I reverse engineer it, right behind it, I believe is impotent rage, the rage of powerlessness. You know, when people feel powerless and they have nothing left to lose, that can then become violence. And then when I was thinking, what is the powerless rage about? So if we reverse engineer that a little bit more emotionally and see, you can ask people about these things. You know, have you ever felt powerless rage? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you get people to talk about it. And what did that feel like? The more they can, or one of my favorite questions is, what was that like for you when they share an anecdote? What was that like for you? And they're opening up more and more. If you don't rush in with advice that they're not asking for, you're actually bathing them in oxytocin, which starts to neutralize cortisol, which causes people to put their amygdala back in the holster and their blood flow goes up to their prefrontal cortex and they can actually think. So if we reverse engineer, again, this is a work in progress. What is the uh, impotent rage about? And I think part of it is, here's a formula, and you can say, I use different than multiply by plus by, but the current version is perceived injustice times duration plus inability to have it redressed by anyone 
and then add, especially to men, humiliation. And when you combine those, and most of the violence is being committed by men. I mean, we, and I think part of it is that women deep down have an ability to bond and they don't default to their intellect. Something that many a frustrated husband say, I wish they would occasionally in my marriage. And I think if you use those words, can you talk about some perceived injustice you've experienced in your life? When was the earliest case of that? When what was happening just seemed in unjust. Can you talk about a perceived injustice that lasted a long time? You know, maybe from abuse in your family to elementary school, all the way to college, all the way to your cynical, sarcastic defense mechanism. Can you share the story of all that? And what was it like for it to last that long? You know, we're not talking years, we're talking a couple of decades. And you have them share stories. What were some of the efforts you made to get someone to hear you, to redress it, to do something? And nobody was listening and no, nobody paid attention. To make it worse, uh, you felt humiliated. You got laughed at. You got put down uh, wherever that was. And I believe that if you can get people using some of those words to share the story and you don't rush in with advice, they have the experience of feeling felt by you. So my surgical empathy approach to life. Also, I believe you need to simplify things in this world. As soon as something becomes complicated, and I also believe you need to use experience near language. Experience near language when you hear it, you can feel it and understand it at the same time. Experience distant language is you have to think about it. And so when I began seeing suicidal patients, they would look at me and I could see that when I was following a protocol, checking boxes, what some of them were screaming out at me with their eyes was, you're checking boxes and I'm running out of time. And I was fortunate because a fellowship I was going to have fell through. So I had the freedom to not have to follow a protocol, to not have to fill in the boxes. And so when I felt that conflict of you're checking boxes and you're keeping distant from me and I'm running out of time, I threw away the boxes and I just dove into their eyes and I just let them take me wherever it needed to take me. And it took me into the dark night of the soul and they had only been there alone. And sometimes they when I would get there, they'd say, what are you doing here? Well, why are you doing this? And I'd look at them like I'm looking at you. And I'd say, well, how long have you been alone here? Forever. I didn't think you should be alone anymore. So we're just going to hang out until you feel less alone. Would that be okay? And it would be more than okay because a number of them just started crying. And the reason I came up with surgical empathy, I wrote an article on Medium called Why People kill themselves. It's not depression. Got 400,000 views in about two weeks. Kind of a sexy title. And I said, there's hundreds of millions of maybe billions of people that are depressed who aren't suicidal. It can contribute to it, but there's a lot of people that are depressed that aren't suicidal. There are a lot of people that lose their job, lose their marriage, and it can contribute, but the vast majority aren't suicidal. And I came up with this observation that nearly all suicidal people feel despair when they're suicidal. And if you break the word despair into D-E-S-P-A-I-R, they feel unpaired with reasons to live. Hopeless, without a future. Helpless, powerless, without the ability to get out of there. Useless, worthless, without any self-esteem or reason to be here. Meaningless, purposeless. And when they all line up, like some slot machine, pointless. And so they pair with death to take away their pain. And they form psychological adhesions, not attachments. It's an adhesion. They grab onto it. I don't want to get into politics, but you know, some of the politics that we're seeing with some of the strong arm leaders in the world, they form psychological adhesions to those figures, not attachments. They're adhesions. Oh, they're so powerful. They'll look after us. They'll take care of us. They really care about us. And actually, when you drill down, they don't care about you at all. But the psychological adhesion is like an adhesion after surgery, and you need to sever it. And surgical empathy is a way to sever it. So here's my, here's my simplistic approach to suicide. I thought they have formed an adhesion to death as a way to take away pain that won't go away anywhere else. And I felt if I can just lessen the pain enough, it might break the adhesion to death. 
It's taking away their pain. It's like the sirens calling out to the sailors, come sail here and your life will be better. And what I discovered is when people felt felt, they paired with feeling felt and feeling felt is different than feeling understood. Feeling understood is better than feeling misunderstood or feeling figured out all in the surface uh, service of providing treatments. But when you're there in the dark night of the soul with a psychological adhesion to death, you need to sever it. Can I share an anecdote that uh, usually I was on Michaela Peterson's podcast. Uh, you can find that. And she actually edited it. So it leads off with that. And she started crying. She doesn't cry. She's like her dad, Jordan Peterson, a lot. And one of my mentors was one of the pioneers in death and dying and suicide prevention. So he would refer me people that other psychiatrists didn't want to see. In order to get a discharge from the inpatient unit, they needed to find someone out in the community who would see these people, and he'd refer them to me. And there was one woman I'll call Nancy. And she'd made several suicide attempts, been hospitalized. And way back then, you could be in the hospital for two or three months. It's, it's not like the revolving door we have now. She'd been in the hospital a couple times a year, several suicide attempts. And I was seeing her, and I didn't think I was helping her at all. And I was seeing her for about six months, and she kept showing up, but I didn't think I was helping her at all. But that was the longest she'd gone without a suicide attempt, but I didn't understand it. And back then I used to moonlight at a psychiatric hospital, a state psychiatric hospital. And sometimes you're up 24, 36 hours, you're covering for other doctors, you're you know admitting them, you're going to the inpatient units, you're putting people into restraints when they're being destructive. So I had been up 24 hours or more, and if you've ever pulled an all-nighter, and I'm guessing some of your listeners have as well as you, you know, you can get a little wigged out. You know, your sphincters don't work as well as they should. Your teeth get loose. And so it was a Monday after one of those weekends. And she never made eye contact with me. 30 degrees to the left or right like this. And her eyes were, you know, always kind of lifeless. She wasn't exactly catatonic, but they were kind of lifeless. I'm sitting with her and she's looking like this. And suddenly all the color in the room turned to black and white. And I'm looking out and the room is black and white. And then I get the chills. And I thought I was having a stroke or a seizure. She didn't make eye contact with me. So I'm a psychiatrist. You know, I've trained in neurology, but mostly psychiatry. So I did a neurologic exam on myself to see if I was having a stroke or seizure. She's like this, and I'm tapping my elbow. I'm going like this. I'm looking at my fingers to see if I have double vision. She's you know, not looking at you anyway, so she doesn't know that you're doing crazy things. Yeah, right, right. So I wasn't being rude, and she was kind of in another place. And I said to myself, well, I'm not having a stroke or seizure. And then I leaned into the chills, and I had this crazy idea that I was looking at the world through her eyes and feeling what the world felt like, black and white and cold. Wow. Oh, wow, I was right. And because I was sleep deprived, I blurted out something that normally I wouldn't say, but I'm a little disinhibited. And I said, Nancy, yeah. I, I didn't know it was so bad. And I can't help you kill yourself. But if you do, I will still think well of you. I'll miss you. And maybe I'll understand why you needed to do it to get out of the pain. And I thought to myself, did I think that or did I say it? And I remember saying to myself, don't write that one in the record. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that realized, one might get your uh, medical license taken away. There you go. And I realized that I'd said it. And what happened is she goes like this, and she goes, and then she locks onto my eyes, figuratively and literally for dear life. And I said, what are you thinking? And I thought she was going to say, thank you for understanding. I'm overdue. And I thought she was going to thank me for understanding and allowing her to kill herself. And I'm looking into her eyes and she's locked onto my eyes. And she said, if you can really understand why I might have to kill myself to get out of this pain, maybe I won't need to. And then she smiled. And then I locked onto her eyes. And I said, I'll tell you what we're going to do. I'm not going to prescribe treatments because you've been on everything. I mean, shock treatment, medication, group therapy, everything. And I said, now, if you suggest maybe we should try something, we'll discuss it. And then I leaned into her eyes and I said, what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to find you wherever you are, which I just did. And I'm going to keep you company there. Would that be okay? And then she smiled. The chills went away. The black and white went away. And that was the beginning of turning a corner. So can you track with that how that maybe intuitively or emotionally made sense? It's remarkable because I'm sitting here just enjoying listening and processing myself. And everything you just shared is such a great 
sample of what I've loved about experiencing your book, Just Listen, because you do such a great job of sharing the insights, things that are so foreign that many of us would never relate to. I've never been dealing with someone who's suicidal. I've never dealt with a hostage situation, but you provide these insights. You reverse engineer it, as you said, down to its elements so that people can understand it. You share the formula in the form of practical, actionable advice and instruction. So a step-by-step instruction, and then these real world examples that range from the example you shared here to marital counseling, to hostage negotiation, though some people may see those as the same thing. But, but I loved this one line from your book where you said that one of your most common functions, and I'm talking about in conflict resolution in particular, because that's really where I want to start to take this discussion is, is the role that listening plays in resolving conflicts whether they're internal or between people. But you said that one of the the most common functions and the most important roles you served was to be the adult in the room. And I, I really appreciated that concept of showing up as the adult in the in the room. Can you explain what that means and also give our friends and family just a taste of maybe one or two more of these colorful stories that illustrate your application of these concepts of conflict resolution and the work you've done in listening to to get there? Well, by adult in the room, I don't mean being authoritarian. I mean putting a stake into the ground of what I call the surgical field of conflict resolution. And what that looks like is if someone refers to me a a conflict situation, uh, so we're talking about conflict resolution, I'll say, before I say yes, I want to speak to each of the parties for 15 minutes, a half an hour, no charge, because if they can't agree to the process I'm going to describe, I'm going to pass. And again, you know, some people just don't do that. Well, this is unconventional. Well, everything I do is unconventional. (laughs) Sorry. Sorry. As we'd say in California, sorry. And when I'd speak to people, I'd say, look, when I do a conflict resolution, the space between you is like a surgical field. Now, I'm not a surgeon. I'm a medical doctor. I can't allow anyone to contaminate it. We'll conduct the process, but if the first sign that either of you or both of you start to get strident, start to get accusatory, start to get sullen, I'm going to call a timeout. And if one of the, and one of you is calmer, I'll say, "Go get enough. Uh, go get some cups of coffee for all of us." And then I would take the person who was triggered, and I'd take them aside, and I'd say, uh, "What was that all about?" And then you, s- and one of my techniques. I think it's in either Just Listen or I have another book called Talking to Crazy, How to Deal with People Who Are Agitated, Drive You Crazy. And I have a technique called the FUD crud technique. And you can use this in your personal life. You could probably use it in your business life with your uh, with customers, clients, or business partners. And FUD crud just makes it more memorable. And so imagine someone venting at you or they're sullen. You let them finish, but instead of telling them to calm down or stonewalling them, you lean in and you say, you seem frustrated and I think you're holding back. What? Yeah, you seem frustrated and I think you're holding back because I think you're really upset and disappointed too. So can we go through those? What is it that you're most frustrated about? And then you pull out of them, you know, what? give me an example. And you don't disagree with them. Oh, I can, I can see how that's frustrating. And you, and that's part of surgical empathy. You're drawing it out of them. And then the second step, you could say, uh, what are you angry about? But people don't like to be told they're angry. And you could say, I can see why you'd be frustrated. Now, what are you upset about? And then you do the same thing. You pull that out of them and you keep them talking, you know, as much as they need to. But the game changer is, and I'm guessing you're disappointed. You're disappointed in me. You're disappointed in you. You're disappointed that here we are again. So what are you disappointed about? Circumstance and outcome. Yeah, absolutely. And so if you can walk people through that, and draw it out of them, when they get too disappointed, it's a calmer conversation because you've enabled them to get the more edgy stuff off their chest. So if I was doing a conflict resolution and I'm, I guess, caucusing with one, I'd say, uh, and I might use this with them, and I, instead of upset, I'd say, you seem frustrated and I think you're holding back. What? Yeah, I think you're also angry and disappointed. Talk to me about those. Oh, and I don't disagree with them. 
But if I can draw that out of each of them and I'd say, look, your lawyers have recommended this if we're going through mediation or something, you're not going to get what you want. And your lawyers have basically said it's better to find a way to settle this because you've already put in too much time and money that you won't get back. Lawyers on both sides have agreed to that. Or the judge has said the courts are crowded. uh, Go to mediation. Given that you're not going to get everything you want, let's see if we can get what you need. So what is the desire? desirable outcome. Can you follow this? You're tracking with them and you've calmed them down. They feel appreciative that you've calmed them down and you've allowed them to vent. And then, and they might say, well, this is the absolute minimum that I need. And then I might say, do you think the approach you're taking in the room is going to get you that outcome? I mean, one of the reasons I'm taking you aside is you're not winning friends and influencing people in that other room. So you're um, not winning right now. (laughs) You're not winning. And then I might brainstorm with them about, you know, well, let's see a way you might be able to get what you need. Or I might advise advise you and say, you know, I can understand at the very least you need that. I still think it's a non-starter, but I could be wrong. And I'm glad that you've kind of calmed down and, you know, we'll go in the other room and I'll go talk to the other person uh, while I'm drinking the coffee they got for us. But, But can you see the framework? And, and, and basically what I'm saying, here's something else that I say in Just listen. And you're doing a very good job of this. So I want want to tell you, you're doing a good job of something and you don't even know you're doing it. What I advise people in Just Listen is we can talk over, at, or to, or with people. And you want to toggle between to and with. And you want to toggle away from over and at. And I've been coaching some motivational speakers and I say, you know, you don't exactly have a cult. Like some people who can get away with the rah-rah stuff, you know, not to mention names. And they may help you with the rah-rah stuff, but they really just want to sell products and courses. Yes, the gurus of the world. (laughs) They don't even expect you to read the products, but they want to pump you up. But they're talking over and at you. And one of the reasons, if you're not one of those gurus, one of the reasons you don't want to talk over and at people is because you take away their choice to engage with you. Because what you're communicating is you better engage with me because uh, if you don't engage with me and buy product, you're an idiot. Yeah. You know, when are you going to change your life? You know, et cetera, et cetera. Do you want to be different than the 3,000 people <laughs> buying you? Whereas when you talk to and with people, you give yeah. people the space to choose to engage with you. And so you've done a great job of talking to and even with. And I want to commend you on it because you know I've been interviewed a fair amount. It must be because you, you sort of value connection and you've done some work on personal development mm-hmm. and you've become aware of the kind of thing that may inadvertently push people away. And you don't want to do that. It's also one of your values that you want people to be able to trust you to not hurt them. Them, which I pick up from you. And unfortunately, that's a that's a unicorn and the world needs that. And here's something you can do if you're listening and watching. And you can actually go to, uh, I'm dying to tell you, I think I have this listed at both TikTok, uh, YouTube, and it's called doing an over at to with audit. And what okay. I'm advising people is go to the people who care about you and they need to be candid. They need to be able to tell you what you need to hear as opposed to just telling you what you want to hear. And if you're listening or watching this saying, I, I'm, I'm committed myself to a program of getting better as a person. Uh, would you agree that if someone talks over at you, it's a little bit alienating, whereas if someone talks to and with you, it's more engaging and inviting. And I want you to be honest with me. In our relationship and the way you see how I conduct myself in meetings, where am I? With the people in those meetings, when I'm with you, do you experience me as talking to and with you? Or do you experience me as talking over and at you? And can you give me some examples? And then what you say is, and by the way, you may think this is being too vulnerable. Some of the CEOs I work with, oh, it's too vulnerable. No, no, no. It's courageous because whoever you're yeah. talking to would never do it. <laughs> They'd never do yeah, it. They're not looking at you. At, yeah, they're not looking at you at week. And then what you want yeah, to do vulnerability is, they, is a source of true power from, from my experience. Absolutely. And so what you want to do is say, uh, Going forward, what must I do consistently that's positive and leaning towards talking to and with people, especially the gold standard is talking with people? And what do I need to stop doing that's being perceived as my talking over and at people? And I want it to be observable because I'd like to check in with you every month and tell me how I'm doing. Well, the brilliance of that exercise is that the work 
is the outcome. Just asking those questions starts that dialogue and leads you in the direction of the outcomes that you're seeking. So it's another, you've shared at least five brilliant frameworks already in the first 43 minutes of us engaging with one another that I hope that the Dadages friends and family will go back and listen to several times or go to your podcast and your platform or read your book to, to pick up those things and really study them. And that's one of the things I was going to share with you is I chose to get Just Listen in an audiobook because I figured it was appropriate. It's titled Just Listen. So I just wanted to listen. But then I realized about halfway through, gosh, I need to go buy this book because I need to be able to take notes. I need to be able to go back and mark passages because there are things in there that I want to apply to my life. And there's going to be two more copies sold in addition to that. I can promise you that because I'm getting two copies for my boys who are 19 and 17 as Hanukkah gifts this year so that they can go through that same exercise. Then we can share it together and go through some of these tools and some of these really valuable elements that as I said, we've only been able to scratch the surface in the time we have here today, but I tremendously value the, the systems, the knowledge, and the approaches that you bring to the table. And that's why you find me listening so actively and talking with you uh, as we're going through all of this is that I just want to try to absorb as much as I can from you in the time that we have together. And I, I want to turn the page though a little bit, and I'm actually going to turn the page backwards. I'm literally going back to the dedication of your book because... As you know, one of the things, Mark, that we spend a lot of time talking about here at Datages is the sharing of knowledge and wisdom. And we want to explore the influences and mentors that really shape a person's life and their work. And the dedication of your book, you identify a couple of those key influences in your life. And I think you referred to one of them actually earlier here today, not by name, but the two that you identified were Warren Bennis, who many refer to as the father of leadership, and the other is Dr. Edwin Schneidman. Can you tell us about the life and work of these two great men and the impact that it had upon you and the work that you've done? Uh, Dr. Schneidman was at UCLA. He was a psychologist. He was real quirky, but he was prolific, and he focused on suicide prevention and death and dying. All my mentors were quirky, including Larry King, who was my last one. And he was a real hoot. And in private, he was quirky <laughs> with that with that growly uh, uh, Brooklyn voice. And Dr. Schneidman uh, was one of the pioneers. He was to suicide prevention and death and dying, what Warren Bennis was to leadership. And he de dedicated uh, Dr. Schneidman his life to suicide prevention, understanding it. Kind of like, I think I learned to come up with these quirky phrases like surgical empathy because he liked to come up with different phrases. So uh, one of his books was called Psych Ache. You know, so he invented that term, you know, you know when, you, when your psyche is just aching, it's hurting. As a publicly proclaimed linguist, File, I can really appreciate that and, and love that trait. And one of his other phrases, uh, I believe, he was the first and he may be the only professor of thanatology. He came up with the term hmm. thanatology, the study of death. He actually came up with that term? I believe so. Wow, because I, I was actually going to ask you about that term because I, I was reading about that and I was curious if you consider yourself as well to be a thanatologist at this stage in your career and with as much study of you, as you put into the topic. I guess I would be, but again, I haven't studied it so much as I've immersed myself into interacting with people, both in the suicide, both in the death and dying, trying to bring comfort to people at the end of their life. And I took note of a lot of things that I would learn from people who had big regrets, you know, some of them pretty well off and powerful, but at the end of the life, they felt that they lived it wrong. And I tried to help them, uh, you know, kind of make peace with themselves. Uh, so that was Dr. Schneidman. He also had an interesting sense of humor. So he had a mentor named Henry A. Murray at Harvard. And Henry A. Murray was uh, an MD, but he was also a psychologist. And he created the TAT, the Thematic Apperception Test, which they don't use anymore. But that was, uh, you know, when you would see themes and, and, and you would say what they reminded you of. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if he did the Rorschach, but he came up with things like that. And one of my favorite uh, uh, quotes from Dr. Schneidman, which he got from uh, Henry A. Murray, which I've applied to my 
current condition, he said, a good death is dying so as to be as little a pain in the ass to your family as possible. And I, I, I ascribe to that big time. And then Dr., uh, then Warren Bennis, anyone who knows anything about leadership, he is seen as one of the, the pioneers. Some people will say he, he gave birth to the topic. It's interesting because one of his mentors was a guy named Douglas McGregor. Douglas McGregor uh, wrote a book called the, the Human Side of Enterprise, and he came up with Theory X and Theory Y. And Theory X was, you better stay on top of people because they're lazy, they're going to try and do the least possible. And Theory Y was, no, 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 no. Help them develop their full potential. Help them become more skilled. Find out what matters to them. And so uh, Douglas McGregor was seen as the originator of organizational development. Wow. I'm smiling because my own father, this is one of the things that from maybe the time I was two years old, I had heard from him over and over and over again, his perspective on Theory X and Theory Y management. And he's the CEO of a company. And he always used to tell me that he invented Theory XY and that XY was that he was going to be directly on top of people and dictating what they were going to do, but making them feel like it was their idea along the way. <laughs> Well, and that's yeah. a, an exact illustration of my father in the way that he runs his business and most of his life. And in many ways, I'm probably a reaction to that approach in the way that I, I handle things in my own life. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I used to belong to a networking group and then we would have lunches. It's interesting in all the communities that I've been a part of, including LinkedIn, I am always the conscience and the empath widely admired and respected, but no one has ever referred business to me. And part of that is because, because I'm a dyed-in-the-wool mentor. And as one of my feisty mentees, this woman, I just like her sense of humor. I put out a tweet, not a tweet, but a LinkedIn thing. I said, what's the difference between a mentor and a coach? And she immediately responded, you have to pay a coach. <laughs> Well, that's a, a terrible statement for those of us that are mentors. We might all end up destitute in the street somewhere without any way to provide for ourselves. Well, yeah, you know, look, I, look, I think hopefully the world is evolving. And uh, anyway, what, but getting back to uh, Warren Bennis, I miss both these men. I think of them probably every day. You know, I can only Dr. Imagine. Schneidman, because I'm facing you know a little bit of mortality here. And uh, Warren Bennis, because leadership is, seems to be getting worse. And I'll share some wonderful anecdotes uh, with, uh, I, I shared the one about uh, Henry A. Murray. I had more with Warren because I've, in the last 15 years, I've expanded what I do, you know, towards leadership. I, it was after his 80th birthday. I'll share two anecdotes, but I, they're endearing, and I hope they put a smile on your face. Whereas your dad would say, what, okay. what was the guy talking about? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so it was after his 80th birthday, and there was a big tribute to him in Boston. David Gergen from CNN, who he mentored, I think, orchestrated it. Uh, Howard Schultz from Starbucks was there, who he mentored. I think yeah. Tom Peters was there, maybe Jack Welch. And so we're having uh, lunch a little bit afterwards, and he said, Mark, they really made a big deal about me, and, and usually I get embarrassed, but I really liked it. And I said, <laughs> I said, Warren, what you don't understand is that the only thing more powerful that people feel towards you beyond respect is people love you. And I think the reason they love you when you think of characters like uh, David Gergen and Howard Schultz, tough business people, tough advisors. I said, something yeah. I discovered with you, Warren, within five minutes of getting to know you is that I could trust you to never hurt me, which mm -hmm. I said to you also. It's, it's the highest compliment. And he looked at me and he said, you know, a lot of nice things being said about me, Mark. And uh, that's the third best one I've ever heard. And I can't remember one and two right now. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. But he was and sure he, there had to have been better ones at some point. <laughs> yeah. And here's, I think, one of my favorite anecdotes is, uh, well, I'll give you a couple anecdotes because, you know, we can talk heart to heart and uh, I think you relate to them. So there was one lunch we had and Warren was known as a deep listener. That was a term that David Gergen used to describe him. And he would make you feel more interesting than he was, but he, he was far more interesting than yeah. me. And so I said, look, you know, I'm, I'm a psychiatrist. You're going to talk. I'm going to listen. And he, he said, what? I said, I mean it. I mean, it. I'm going to shut up and you're going to talk. 
come on, Warren. And he started talking and then he talked some more and then he got enthusiastic and he spit in my food <laughs> he, and he looked at me and he saw that I saw him spitting in my food. And he said, Mark, I think I just sprayed your food. And I said, Warren, when people ask me, what's it like to be mentored by Warren Bennis? I say to them, every time I'm with him, I try to absorb him into my DNA. And I think that helped. Literally. And here's the most That's endearing fantastic. one. That, that, that touched me. I hope it'll touch you. When he was getting sick towards the end, and I'm in touch with my feelings, and uh, I would start to tear up. I wouldn't go boo-hoo, but I'm eating, he's talking, I'm crying. And he didn't comment about it, and I didn't comment about it, but it happened about two or three times in a row. And one of the things a lot of these gurus don't like is they don't like to be used. So I never asked anything of my eight mentors. I never asked them to introduce me to anything. I asked them for nothing because the gift of their precious time was gift enough. And I think that's one of the things yeah. they valued with me is they could lower their guard because I would never hit on them. So yeah. I'm there. Yeah, they didn't have to be on the lookout for that. Yeah. And so I think it was the third time and I kind of reframed it. I said, Warren, uh, you know, have you noticed that I, you know, kind of get emotional when we're together. And he said, yeah, I noticed that, Mark. I said, well, I've been using you. And he goes, what? Because I knew he, he didn't like that. What do you mean? I said, I've been using you because when I'm with you, I'm healing the relationship between me and my dad who died years ago that I never thought would heal. And when I am tearing up, it's with relief because I never thought it would heal. And again, he would say, not a bad way to use me, Mark. <laughs> Truly, I mean, it's remarkable that someone that occupied such an important role in one aspect of your life could actually become a proxy and a way for you to address another aspect of your life. I thank you so much for sharing the stories about Warren and about Dr. Schneidman, because you not only shared stories about them, but you painted this family tree, this lineage of wisdom and how it's been handed down through the ages and how it's vested in you. And now you're sharing it with us. It helps me feel connected to some of these great men that have had a role in your life. And I, I really value you sharing that with me and with the, the rest of the Datages, friends and family. And there I go, friends and family, crying again. Mark got me. But you're all used to that by now. Mark is spot on, though. Everything he shared really is what Datages is all about. This is a great place for us to pause for today. Please join us next week when we bring you the conclusion of this interview with Mark Goulston. And until then, remember, Dad may not always know what he's talking about, but he sure can sound like he does.